Hello, everybody, and welcome to all of you that are here in person and everyone that's joining us online as well. My name's Rebecca. I'm the director of HistFest. On behalf of HistFest and the British Library, I just want to thank you for being here today. For some reason, I'm really, really nervous, which is really strange because we did an event on Thursday. So <laughs> if I fluff my lines, then, you know, I can only apologize. Um, just a few housekeeping things that I need to go through with you beforehand. Um, if you want to ask questions, obviously, if you're in the audience, you can do this in the usual way. There'll be a time for asking questions towards the end. Just raise your hand and we'll um, give you one of our roaming mics to um, ask your question to the panellists. If you're watching at home, you can also put forward your questions online. There's a box for you to do that on the platform. Um, there is live speech to text captioning and BSL interpretation as well, should you require that. Um, if you're interested in buying books, which I'm sure you are, we're in a library, um, then you can do that if you're here in person. We ha obviously have Blackwells outside. You can purchase any of our speakers' books um, from outside. Well, actually, one of them's not out till June, but you need to wait until then, and you, you must <laughs> buy it. Um, but you, the rest of them are there, um, and you can do that, and um, there'll be a signing afterwards. If you're watching online, you can access the link um, on the platform as well to purchase books. I think that's everything. If I've forgotten anything, I've said my thank yous, I've said who I am, I've said where you are, so I think that's it. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jamie McCall from PLB to introduce our first event properly. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Jamie McCall from PLB and we're delighted that Rebecca and the HISFest team have invited us back again this year to be involved in this amazing festival and to also support this event, the How to Survive a Tudor and Stuart Court. A quick bit about PLB, we're a creative museum design consultancy who design and deliver experiences that really engage visitors in, into our shared history. We work with museums, historic houses and galleries and have recently completed projects for Home Farm at Temple Newsom in Leeds, the Star Car exhibition at the Yorkshire Museum, and Army at Home Gallery for the National Army Museum here in London. So I would now like to introduce, uh, introduce you to our host, Charlie Higson. He is an author, actor, comedian, and writer for television and radio. He wrote the incredibly successful Young Bond series, which has now sold over a million copies in the UK and has been translated into over 24 different languages. His latest Bond adventure is On His Majesty's Secret Service. His TV successes include The Fast Show, Randall and Hopkirk Deceased, and the 2015 Jekyll and Hyde. He is the host of the popular podcast Willy Willy Harry Stee, which tells the history of the monarchy. Please give a warm welcome to Charlie and guests. Whoa, 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 whoa. I will have none of this. I will have no rabble rousing. I am Captain Kitely of the Earl of Manchester's Regiment of Foot. This is Pikeman Rose. And we've been sent here because we have heard tell of murmurings, conspiracies, and rebellious rabble rousing in this part of, well, not even in London, you're not even in London, <laughs> outside of the lines of communication, outside of the walls of London. You're in King's Cross, of all places. <laughs> so we have been sent to make sure that there will be no conspiracies against Parliament. Because I have been sent by the Commons of England, assembled in the Palace of Westminster, who have decreed the need for one pound of cheese, a carrot. This is your shopping list. <laughs> <clears throat> the Parliament of England do decree that the following are upon day release from the Tower of London. They are here for academic purposes, and if any of them begin to express any royalist tendencies, you are to report them uh, to us immediately. We are just outside. So... There are doctors on this list. I wouldn't go to a doctor if I were you. Not for, not for this kind of thing. Uh, we have Dr. Alexander Courtney. 
Dr. Nicola Clark, Ophelia Field, and some ne'er-do-well called Charlie Higson. <laughs> now, none of these people are of the parish. They are here upon the tolerance of Parliament. And I want you to give them a massive round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Willy, Willy, Harry, Stee, Harry, Dick, John, Harry, three. One, two, three, Ned's Richard, two. Henry's four, five, six, then who? Edward, four, five, Dick the Bad, Harry's twain, and Ned the Lad. Mary, Bessie, James, Evain, Charlie, Charlie, James again. William and Mary, Anna, Gloria, four Georges, William and Victoria. Then comes Edward, George, and Ned the Eighth quickly goes and abdicates. Then comes George and Lizzie too, and Charlie next to see us through. That is a rhyme that I learnt at school in the 1960s as a way of remembering all of the kings and queens. Um, back in the days when schools taught old-fashioned narrative history. And in lockdown, as a way of keeping sane, I, and, and having a project, I kind of relearned the rhyme and I thought I'd like to find out who all these people were and what they did, how they fitted together. You know, we know all the big names, but, you know, people like, who was Henry III? Who was Edward IV? What did George II do? And, you know, I, I found it quite fascinating, and I thought it would make a good podcast. And so last year, to coincide with the coronation of Charles III, I launched my podcast, Willy Willy Harry Steer, which is a basic narrative history of, of this country, seen through the lens of the royals. Um, so I started with William the Conqueror, and it's basically a monarch per week in chronological order. But I also do side episodes, looking at other aspects of what was going on. Um, and that's what, that's what we're doing here today. Um, I'm very pleased. It's a great honor to be opening this weekend's festivities here at Histress, not least because I'm not a historian. I am a complete fraud. <laughs> I didn't read history at university, I've never taught history, I've never written any history books, but I am fascinated in it. And there's a huge number of people in this country who are fascinated in, in history and, and in our history. And I think many of them, like me, are interested in filling, the, filling in the gaps, knowing how we got from one place to another, how one thing followed another, and how we start back with William the first and end up where we are today. And it's been really interesting for me to make this series. And um, for me, the most fun part is, in every episode, I talk for a bit, and then I get a proper historian on to talk to, 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 to really fill me in on this stuff. And it's been really great fun and really interesting meeting so many historians over the, over the past year. And one of them who came in to talk to me about James II was Rebecca Radil, who introduced the event and was involved in setting up this whole festival. Um, and we had great fun, and afterwards she said, would I like to do an event here at Histfest? And as I say, you know, it's fantastic to do this, the opening one for this weekend. Um, and, you know, I've met many other historians, uh, including... Ophelia Field, who was um, a guest for Queen Anne, talked about Queen Anne and her favourite, Sarah Churchill. Um, but it's given me great pleasure to meet two more historians today who I've not met before. That is... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, don't want to get it wrong. Alex Courtney and Dr <laughs> Nicola Clark. So please give a round of applause. <laughs> I'm terrible with names. <laughs> so, yes, so this event is about the Tudor and Stuart courts, how to survive a Tudor and Stuart court. And so let's just properly meet my guests today, and we'll do it in historical order. We will start with you, Nicola. Your new book, The Waiting Game, is out on the 25th of this month, and... Well, there are copies here today. Uh, and its subtitle is The Untold Story of the Women Who Served the Tudor Queens. So tell us a bit about your book. 
Yeah, hi, it's great to be here. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I wrote a book about the ladies in waiting who served the six wives of Henry VIII. Because that seemed to me like a really obvious topic that no one else had written a book about. And then I really quickly found out why no one else had written a book about it. <laughs> because the archive and the source material, because the turnover of six wives is so fast, that actually the source material is gappy and bitty, and they threw it away, and they burned it, and meh, women. So I spent a long time in the archive trying to piece things back together, because I'm interested in kings and queens, but I'm almost more interested in the people around them, the people who are the next rung down. Who helped the monarchs step into that role and hit the ground running? Who is around them, protecting them, or shopping them to the authorities? Um, and what are these women doing? Because ladies in waiting are never not there. They're always there. And they, they have this weird twofold kind of role. They're there to be the queen's confidants and her friends, but they're also there to be her chaperone. So if you're the queen, do you tell your ladies in waiting your secrets because they're your friends or your family and you trust them? Or are you aware that they might turn king's evidence if you do something you're not supposed to do? And how did these women negotiate that? That's what I was interested in. How did they survive? So yeah, we're going to talk about that today. Excellent. And historically next, we get to you, Alexander Courtney, an associate fellow of the Royal Historical Society, but you are mainly, that very valuable thing, a school history teacher. So let's hear it for all. <laughs> and you have four book projects in the pipeline about the Stuart period, the first of which, about England's first Stuart monarch, James I, is out in June. And so as not to annoy the Scotch, <laughs> we also have to refer to him as James the Sixth. Although, can we just call him James to keep things simple? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and that book is called James the Sixth, Britannic Prince, King of Scots and Elizabeth, King of Scots and Elizabeth's heir. So, I mean, what drew you to write about James? Well, I mean, um, thank you very much for having me, first of all. Um, I've been fascinated by James for 20-something years. Um, it was really my introduction to the idea of historical research was through working on uh, James and his passion for hunting. And I just went from there. And um, a few years ago, I was fortunate, very fortunate, to be asked uh, to write a biography of him. Um, and stupidly, I said yes. <laughs> um, and I say stupidly because remarkably for a figure who is so important in the history of these islands uh, the first king both self-proclaimed king of great britain there hasn't been an academic biography of him for many decades um, and i then discovered why <laughs> um, and a one and a single volume project then became a two volume project so the book that's coming out uh, in june is the first of two volumes, and it covers the period up to uh, the death of Elizabeth I and James's accession to the thrones of uh, the throne of England and, and Ireland. Um, and I think that James is so he's such a misunderstood figure, and partly that is because uh, archivally there is a major problem. Uh, in that if you uh, want to try and tackle the whole of his life and, uh, and reigns, you have to gain an understanding of very different archival deposits in different kingdoms. Uh, you have to gain an understanding of different uh, structures of the court, which we might come on to. Um, and also, uh, what does survive is, uh, is not neatly collated, even in one kingdom, <laughs> in one place. Um, and so it's um, that formidable task, or the first volume of that formidable task, that I've just completed. 
But that, I mean, surely that's the historian's job. If someone had already done it, we would <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Though I suppose that maybe, um, uh, maybe a school teacher who has quite a lot else on his plate yes. might be the first person to come to with that task. But no, I mean, I think it will be really interesting to look at the differences between the, the Scottish court and the, and the English court. Uh, so, and also, I do think that you know, the Stuarts are... People are getting more interested in the Stuarts. Hmm. Um, Maybe, no offence, Nikki, we've had a lot of the Tudors. <laughs> yeah. But as you say, you, you've gone into areas that hasn't, haven't been looked at. Um, and Ophelia, you, um, you, would you be fair to say you describe yourself as a historical biographer rather than as a historian? Definitely. And I won't, uh, because I know this is going to go out on your podcast, so I'm not going to repeat everything I've said about uh, Sarah Churchill, who was the subject of my book, The Favourite, all over again. But um, yes, I mean, she was, you know, she came when I was much younger. It was published back in 2002 originally. Um, she fascinated me as an individual, and it was through my fascination with her as an individual that I then came to an interest in her period, which actually, since she lived for 80 years, plus years is like pretty long. I had to do several monarchies <laughs> through her, which um, by the time she got to the end, I think it was her fifth coronation, she was so sick of it. She just, she went to the coronation, she just asked one of the drummers to put down a drum and plonked herself down on it. She just couldn't be asked. She was just like, I've had it with all these <laughs> coronations. And I, I knew how she felt by the time I finished the book. I was beginning to lose the will. But you are, but you are now also working on a bit, a book on James I, but you're not stepping on Alex's toes because yours is fiction. Yes, I am working on a, fictional, a biofiction, as they say, um, uh, about some people in the court of James I. So we will have some conversation between uh, that. But I have, I have tried to respect historical fact enough that um, I hope all of you who are in this audience won't be hating it for, <laughs> for being fiction. So this is... Uh, the title of this talk is How to Survive a Tudor and Stuart Court. And, you know, we all talk about the royal court and the court of Henry VIII. And we sort of, you, you say that and you kind of picture women in elaborate embroidered dresses and men in floppy hats being very self-important. But I think very few of us really know what a royal court is and how it works and how it functions and what the structure of that is. Um, and, um, Nikki, as you very much have written that book about the ladies-in-waiting at court, perhaps you could tell us how the structure of a Tudor court works. Yeah, more or less. Uh, so there's a king's court, sometimes called the king's side, and then if there is a queen, which usually there is, there would be a queen's court and a queen's side, and they mirror one another. So the king has his immediate, we might call them body servants, who help him get dressed in the morning and things like that. Now, for Henry VIII, they tend to be his mates, and they are the gentlemen of his privy chamber. Um, the queen has her ladies-in-waiting on the other side, same thing. You've got security, not as much security as you might think in a Tudor court, because they seem to be a little bit less worried about assassins under Henry VIII than they were a bit later. Interesting. Um, so you have some security who don't let Joe Bloggs through the door. Um, who else have you got? You've got the privy councillors who run the day-to-day -day business of the kingdom in delegation from the king. Um, well, with my schoolboy mind, uh, the one I'm always interested in is the groom of the stool. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> yes, the groom of the stool is in charge of the king's toilet. Pretty much. He attends the king when the king uses the close stool. Um, now, he's also in charge of the privy purse. So he's in charge of the king's private money in the chamber, basically. So it's a pretty important position. You would think it would be not, wouldn't you, because of what he's supposed to do. But actually, it's almost like he's in charge of the privy chamber, and therefore he's very, very close to the king. Think how many times you go to the loo in the day. That's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the King of England. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty um, important position. And how, do, how does a royal court relate to, to Parliament? Are there crossover roles in there, or is it a completely separate entity? There 
there probably are some crossovers for men, not for women. Women don't sit in Parliament as MPs, and they didn't sit in the House of Lords. Um, for men, yes, there might be some peers who have a role at court and also sit in Parliament. Generally, they are, I would say they're reasonably separate. A little bit of overlap, but not lots. But, but does the Royal Court exert power? I mean, are, are you, is Parliament having to negotiate with the Royal Court to get to the King, for instance, Alex? Um, well, I, I think that one of the things that we have to really understand about the distinction between the court and, say, Parliament is that, unlike in our political world, um, Parliament then is, is an event. Right. It's, not, it's, not a, it's not a permanent, uh, everyday uh, uh, aspect of government, whereas the court is. The court is the permanent heart of everyday central government and of, of the high political universe. Um, and so there are, there are overlaps of personnel between a parliament and the court, but they are, uh, but they are sort of fleeting. Yeah. They're, they're, um, so you will, have, you will have people connected with the court or who sometimes or quite often might hold household office or privy conciliar office who, when there is a parliament sitting, are the MP for so-and-so, or uh, if they're a member of the House of Lords. But they are distinct. And of the two, I suppose, in the, 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 the Stuart period, uh, in the early Stuart period in particular, there's been a tendency for historians, a lot of political history to be written about parliamentary history, yeah. and not quite as much and so, uh, about what, to my mind, really mattered, which is what's happening in this both place and network of people mm. that was referred to by contemporaries as the court. Yeah. Um, so court is a, really, is a really interesting word when you yeah. see it in original uh, documents of the period because sometimes the, the writer will mean where the king is at that point. So a location, though that location moves around uh, the, the country. Um, or they will mean a loose grouping of people, mm. of families, of their connections, which is the court. So it's both a, a place and a, and a social environment. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, a, it, it's, a really, it's a really difficult, fluid thing yeah. to try to get yeah. hold of. Um, it's much more interesting studying that than studying parliament. And, a, <laughs> and especially, I mean, under James I, like from 1614, Parliament wasn't even met for seven years. So there's not mm. even, I mean, that's a long time for there to be no Parliament to come in. Yeah, but I mean, roles, roles like, and I don't know the proper names for them, you know, like the Royal Treasurer and the Chamberlain and that, are they considered mm. court or Parliament? Oh, definitely court. Right. So there's the institution, the household, and it's three, well, in periods I know anyway, three parts of office. I don't know if there were three in the Tudor periods, but, but you know, there's the institution, but then, as you say, a much more sort of fluid um, body, entity, <laughs> yeah. of so-called hangers-on. I was quite thrilled when there's a 1619 proclamation from James mm. I saying, get, get rid of the hangers-on. <laughs> and I was like, that's the first time you don't expect these mm. terms. Oh, that's yeah. an enduring theme. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even in Henry VIII's reign, they are desperately, continually trying to retrench, because it's impossible to know who is allowed to be there and who is just kind of dining at the king's expense? Yeah. <laughs> just going to check. You, and you, know? can, you, can, you can track it. You can, yeah. uh, you can go to, uh, to household accounts and you can create graphs of, of just how much, how much are the hangers-on costing in, in dining rights, essentially, yeah. <laughs> over time. So you can see that, well, there's a peak around Easter. There's a peak <laughs> at Christmas time. Yeah. Um, and so it, it is a, it is a, fluid, a fluid thing. Yeah. And then there's the, in the institutional bit, you've got the sort of hangers-on in the minor job. So you've got things like keepers of the king's armadillo or something. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, mm. but then there are the unemployed hangers-on who are just, you know, lucky, trying to get through the gate every day, basically. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So, so when you've got a king, and a, a king and a queen, they have sort of separate households. So what happens then when you get just a queen, say, with Queen Anne? Is she using her royal court, her royal household, to try and 
influence things to hang on to power. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a difference between a queen consort's court and a queen regnant's court. Yeah. And, you know, for Queen Anne, and what that means, in effect, in effect is when I'm talking about um, her favourites and Sarah and things and how they survived court, they, in a sense, in Sarah Churchill's case, she wasn't so much surviving court as surviving actually the politics because, of, you know, the actual um, high politics were what influenced her survival or not, not so much the um, personal politics going on in the court. But, um, sh you know, I think queen consorts have, you know, other ways of exercising soft power mm -hmm. and Anne, in a way, was trying to sort of do both the sort of patronage of the arts and other things going on that mm -hmm. she was trying to do simultaneously to also having to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, policy and law. So, it was, you know, she had a lot to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what sort of a mix of people are we going to have in, in a royal, royal court? I mean, there can't all be noble men and women, and presumably they're not always necessarily all English, Scottish, whatever. Uh, true, absolutely. You do get, um, well, for instance, the minute you get a consort queen who is not from England, she will bring certain members of her household from her native country with her. And that includes ladies-in-waiting. So Catherine of Aragon came over to marry Prince Arthur in 1501. She brought Spanish women with her, some of whom, not very many, but some of whom just never left, stayed forever. Um, so yes, the court is a bit of a melting pot. And it isn't just members of the household, but uh, certainly earlier on in the Tudor period, this is the time of the Renaissance, which basically means everything Italian becomes super cool. So Italians were the best at everything artsy in English eyes because we were a bit late to the Renaissance because in the 15th century we were having a big civil war, you know, we didn't have time. Um, so in the Tudor period, Henry VIII wants everyone Italian to come to his court and make paintings and sculpture and all of this. Um, so artists, musicians, but also ambassadors from other countries and their servants that they bring with them. So, yeah, I think it is not just an English setup here. And it's the same with um, uh, under James, with Anna of Denmark, yeah. uh, his consort, that she retains through her life uh, a number of Danish servants. Uh, there had, uh, there had uh, throughout James's life in Scotland, been English servants in his household. He has a, a group of English viol players, the Hudsons, um, he has an Irish bard, uh, at least at one point. There's a lynx, there's an armadillo. So it's quite, <laughs> it's quite exotically populated in that sense. And, and I gather there was a strong resistance when, when James came down from Scotland to take the English throne of, of like all the English courtiers thinking hang about we're being replaced by the Scots. So, uh, yeah, th that, that is a feature of, uh, of some political comment... Um, it certainly that does... like a very polite way of saying, no, Charlie, you're talking <laughs> bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. I think it's... Um, uh, certainly in Parliament, in right. Parliament, in uh, between 1604, 1610, 1614, there is a lot of anti-Scottish commentary, particularly in the Commons, from people who had axes to grind and were very, very foolish like profoundly moronic people <laughs> uh, who have a political death wish will say anti-Scottish things, but they keep coming back for more. <laughs> um, and I, the, the idea, though, that the accession of a Scottish monarch was not popular, actually, I think, is deeply problematic because James, when Elizabeth dies, everyone is pleased. Everyone is pleased. At last... She has kicked the bucket. <laughs> and we can get on with normality. And normality is not having, uh, though she's English, uh, an unmarried you know, spinster queen who just keeps on living and not sorting out the succession. What you want is, what you want is, a, is, is an established dynasty with a clear line of succession. And so James VI of Scotland is, is welcomed for that reason, but he's not just welcomed because, as John Guy put it, he's male, Protestant, and available, though that ha helps. <laughs> um, uh, there is, uh, he's assiduous 
um, through the 1580s, 90s, at connecting with English people, uh, with English opinion. He's very sensitive to English uh, uh, political opinion. And in the years before Elizabeth's death, uh, there is a network of English supporters of his claim. Um, and you see, uh, uh, with the accession of James to the English throne, that what they had, what English, the English are profoundly neurotic as a people, aren't you? Uh, that, um, but uh, what they had feared was that there'd be a civil war or that it'd be foreign intervention. And he said, there's nothing. There's nothing. There is, there is peace. Um, and James is able, um, apart from, yeah, it's more than these MPs who I think are cretins. Um, but, so there is an anti-Scottish current, but it's not, I think, as important as that parliamentary history tends to lead us to believe. But it, because under James, what happened, if you're talking about shifts in the court, is that the bedchamber became more important and more powerful mm. as a part of the institution, the, the staff mm. of the bedchamber. And they were all Scots until 1617. Yeah. So that was from 1603 to 1617. No, mm. you know, the, the Scottishness of the bedchamber was an issue. Um, and then George Villiers' younger brother, hopeless, incompetent younger brother, Kit, got put into the bedchamber as the first Englishman. Well, so, after George. Well, yes, after George, yes, sorry. Uh, so, yes, so, you know, you have this kind of um, resentment about the pro those who are in proximity to the king, because if mm. we're talking about a court, it's all these layers of proximity and people in these rooms and these sort of airlock rooms between, <laughs> the, you know, with the gushes, you know, the concentric circles of people orbiting and how close you are to the, the royal oh, person. One could also say to that that, well, uh, we don't see a lot of, uh, of English male courtiers yeah. cross-dressing to go into body service to Elizabeth I so they can get close to her. Mm -hmm. So there is an element of, of, of that going on, of profound hypocrisy um, in that creating a Scottish bedchamber is a very clever political manoeuvre in some ways because the Scottish court has different mm. etiquette to the English court. So if you want to continue to allow Scots to be able to access their monarch as they did before, mm. you have to create within the English um, uh, court etiquette a space which they can enter but which Englishmen can't freely mm. enter. And, 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 I mean, the, the title of the talk is How to Survive One of These Courts, which implies that not everybody did. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I suppose that How to Survive relates to the monarchs and to the actual royal court. And how, how dangerous was the, the Tudor court? Um, it depends who you are and when you are <laughs> and how loud you are. Um, so I was thinking about this. Um, in the last week, and a line from Hamilton the Musical popped into my head, <laughs> where Aaron Burr tells a young Alexander Hamilton, talk less, smile more. Don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. And in Henry VIII's court, to be quite honest, that's a pretty good way to survive, because this is the beginning of the religious reformation. And it's not yet as clear-cut as Protestant versus Catholic as it became later on. It's all a bit murky, but for that reason, it's quite dangerous to believe really anything that's remotely on an extreme edge of anything. So actually, you want to kind of keep, keep your head down. When people ask you what you're doing, just, just go along with it. And there are some people who survived a really long time doing that. Uh, there's a guy called William Howard, Lord Howard of Effingham, um, who um, really never did anything particularly startling, never believed anything that he wasn't supposed to believe. He was a cousin of Elizabeth I, and so he became a pretty big deal in her household until his death in the 1570s. And he just, he goes slightly under the radar, but it's because he never did anything extraordinary. And actually, that's a really great way to survive, even if it makes you boring to historians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and presumably, particularly in Henry VIII's court, you had to be careful. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the friend of yours leaves their wife, and you say, well, I never really liked her. I have to survive. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
and then they go back to them a few weeks later. But, um, you know, who you give your allegiances to with the, with the different wives and all those really complicated connections going on there. Yeah, for ladies in waiting, it gets complicated because Henry keeps changing wife. So you get a job under one queen consort, and they're, oh, hang on, hang on a minute. No, that one's gone, that one's dead. What do I do now? Um, and it is tricky because, as you would expect, each queen consort likes to bring in ladies in waiting who are her own friends and family. She's going to rely on the people who've supported her before, who she thinks she can trust. There is an element of keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. So uh, there, there's a little bit of that. And as a queen consort coming in, you might also need some experienced ladies in waiting who, who have served the previous wives, who know what they're doing, because a lot of Henry's wives didn't know what they were doing, because they were not born to be queen. So you need people around you who can tell you, tip you the wink when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Um, but it, it was difficult. Um, I'm not aware of any lady-in-waiting who served all six wives. There's lots of names that come up um, and kind of become urban legends, I suppose, of women who did, but when you actually try and burrow down into the sources and really pin it down, usually you can't. Um, there are some who served five of six. That's doing, that's doing pretty well. Um, and normally you make yourself indispensable and not necessarily to the queen, but maybe to the king or to one of the king's chief ministers. If Thomas Cromwell thinks you're useful, he'll get you a job in the next queen's household. And that happens a lot. There's a woman called uh, Jane Parker, Viscountess Rochford, who started under Catherine of Aragon, married Anne Boleyn's brother, so carried on there, uh, survived miraculously Anne Boleyn's execution, and carried on until Catherine Howard, but then helped Catherine Howard to possibly sleep around. Bad move. That is not how to survive the Tudor court. Uh, and she did not. Um, she is the first lady in waiting that I'm aware of to have been executed as a direct result of her job of being a lady in waiting. Um, so that did not go so well. I mean, in, in James's court, was it as dangerous? It's not quite as dangerous. Uh, or, well, it's not as dangerous as, as under Henry VIII because James is... He does have a ruthless streak. Um, and there are, there are some, uh, some tragic victims of his ruthlessness. Um, and that's where his uh, sacrificing of innocence in the witch uh, hunts mm -hmm. of the 1590s especially comes in. But there are other examples. He tends to be... Um, merciful to those whom he knows and who are politically significant. And so that makes it not usually um, uh, terminally dangerous uh, <laughs> handling um, James VI and I. Uh, but you still have to not do stupid things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, you, you have also to, uh, to be able to it's like someone ought to write. Someone ought to write as one of those sort of corporate self-help sort of books, like for, for wannabe businessmen. It's like the Donald Trump, the art of the deal. It would be whatever. Um, Castiglione's art of the... Well, Francis Bacon tried to write a guide like that, but that's one of the things you shouldn't do if you're trying to be a good courtier, is write a guide to, to, yeah. that sort of patronises everyone by telling them how to be good courtiers and just gets up their noses, and yes. then they're just like... But you do, but I think that the, the... My point is that you had to be able to manage upwards mm. by projecting to the king that your agenda is his agenda, mm. is being articulated in, in whatever language it is that he is caked his own self-presentation in. But then you also have to project downwards and sideways. There's a lot of management of reputation mm. as well as this sort of working towards the Fuhrer type, mm. type thing. So for James, um, James uh, is, um, is... His concept of what a king is is fundamentally that he's a divinely appointed judge to judge righteous judgment, as he puts it. Uh, that, so justice matters to him. If you can present whatever you're doing or whatever you want in terms of justice, he might well go along with it. Uh, if, you, if you're going to present what you want in terms of rewarding somebody who you know that he might reward, that's how you do it. So if you're a consortium of, uh, of 
businessman on the make, and you have a project, some monopoly of, you know, you think that, that um, starch produ production, starch manufacture is, is um, in London is noisome to the populace, uh, and we could make some money out of regulating that. Well, then you put together a petition to the king saying that this is, a, this is a crying shame, it's an injustice to the people, it's causing disease and illness, so we will regulate it and we'll rake in the profit from that. We'll maybe give the crown a little bit. Uh, this is justice. And he might go with it. He's even more likely to go with it if you leave a blank on the petition into which the name of a favoured courtier might be added <laughs> yeah. because then they confront it. They yeah. confront the scheme. So there are these, these ways of working with the king. Mm. You certainly can't work against him. You mustn't get him wrong by thinking that he's simple. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, by the time you get to Anne, they're not executing people who've fallen. No, it's out. just people's they're... reputations being yes. axed in the press, basically. You're being cancelled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, no, uh, that's true. And, uh, you know... The longevity of survival, I mean, the thing of, you know, crossing regimes is also, if we're talking about survival, surviving the change of courts. I mean, um, Villiers, obviously a genius at managing to be a favourite both under James I and then his son. And, you know, Sarah Churchill, in a way, although she, you know, lost the battle famously with um, Abigail Masham, I mean, she does, you know live on to have a, a role as, far, as much as she wanted one in the Hanoverian court and that kind of thing, although she also made her enemies there. But, you know, she, she was the absolute opposite of your maxim about smiling yeah. and talking less than smiling. Well, she was the antithesis of that, um, just could not shut up, and um, which made her a joy in terms of primary source material. Um, just huge, huge... Um, volume right here in the British Library of her papers uh, that just voluble uh, opinions on absolutely everything. Um, and yes, that was bound to get her in trouble, and it did, <laughs> basically. So, you know, she, she, she thought she could survive in terms of friendship that we would understand in a much more normal way in terms of friendship rather than as a courtier. And mm. she was wrong in that. She was wrong to think that her years of friendship with Queen Anne as a princess in the 1690s and things had stored up enough credit to see her through. Um, that was a miscalculation. Mm. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, the position of the favourite. And right through the, the, the royal history, we, we see that of what... The court hates is the monarch having a favourite, and you, that's the worst position to be in. Almost is, is as a favourite. Yeah, uh, the the monarch is in a really uh, a really difficult position because they 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 could do everything by the by the book of what the the the, the nobility might expect, and they would be a sort of dried out, lonely husk. Mm. They need to have friends. They need to have companions. Um, but their companions, their friendships are political. Mm. And so they have this, this really difficult balancing act uh, uh, to, to try to work out there. And one of, with James VI and I and George Villiers, the, the Duke of Buckingham, uh, there is this, this famous line that James uses in 1617, speaking to formally to his Privy Council on his return to his one visit back to Scotland after 1603. James says that, uh, that uh, Jesus had his John, and I have my George, and you should know that I love him more than any other. Um, now, to us, that seems really, really quite shocking. And some, uh, some historians, commentators have interpreted uh, that as, a, as some sort of reflection on, on a homosexual relationship, which is a, quite a curious reading of scripture as well, um, uh, to say the least. Um, but it's, it does seem that what, what James meant by that, the, the, the one source that we have from that, uh, for that speech is a Spanish ambassador. And the Spanish ambassador says of this speech that it is uh, an, uh, a, a, an oration that was muy formada, 
It's a, it's a well-structured speech. So it's not the, ram the ramblings of some love-struck, you know, 50-year-old right. <laughs> puppy. Um, oh, I have my George. Um, but instead, what he's trying to say is, look, there are models of how, in scripture even, of how a king, King Jesus himself, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus has, Jesus has yeah. the disciples, and he has the apostles, and he has a tighter circle within those that includes the disciple whom he loved. And that is then uh, a, a justifiable, right, a totally justifiable um, sort of, um, uh, sort of copper-bottomed mm -hmm. argument for I need a friend. Yeah. I need to be able to share that, that infinite privacy to be able to speak to somebody and speak my mind, and they might be able to speak it back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll agree with them yeah. or not, yeah. and mm -hmm. that's what Somerset Mm. Buckingham's predecessor gets wrong. Yeah. He talks his mind, and James doesn't like it. Yeah. Um, and he also is to the Queen, which is, doesn't, um, help. doesn't help. I think Henry VIII thought, you know, if Henry VIII had subscribed to that, which I'm not sure he did, I think he, he would have thought just everybody was potentially Judas. Mm. I think that's Henry VIII's mm. mode. Because he has mates, he has friends, but then he turns on them and cuts their heads off, <laughs> which... Yeah, James doesn't do that. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty with the favourite is obviously everyone else in court trying to yeah. get them out of the way because yeah. they want that. You or know, you that hook system. onto them. That's the... Yeah. That's yeah. the it, you, you hook onto their coattails because they will be able to move you places. Yeah. So you can... You cut have, both ways. You have these, always with the favourites, you have like larger consortiums of backers behind favourites pushing a certain favourite forward, at least at the beginning of their careers, of putting fa uh, presenting favourites. And some of the biggest, talk about the, the non-survivors, the sort of mm. failures at court, are the sort of attempts at doing that that don't work. So you have, like, with James, there were several very funny ones of... Um, uh, this uh, guy called um, William Monson, first of all, who starts that they, he has this group of backers who washed his face every day with posset curd, which is a sort of mix of beer and milk, basically. I'm not quite sure what yeah. that was supposed to help. But, you know, and he's presented forward, and then James just isn't interested, and he tells everyone, all the young men, to stop coming on to him, basically. And the Lord, Lord, James, there's a gossip who basically sort of says the next day, the, the court has, all the young men at court have disappeared like mushrooms because the king has said, go, get out of my way. Um, and then, and he ends up, and Villiers takes his revenge on that attempt, um, and basically um, his backer gets punished. And then there's another one, Arthur Brett, who just puts his hand on the king's uh, bridle when they're out hunting in Waltham Forest, and, and that's, again, too bold. And the, his backers also get, you know, it's not so much the young man. Well, he does end up in the fleet prison, but <laughs> the backers are the ones who really fall from power. And then there's this one who wasn't so much of an attempt, but it was uh, this guy called Henry Rich who said, they said, the record says he um, lost his chances at preferment because he spat after the king had slobbered in his mouth, <laughs> which he really shouldn't do. So, <laughs> so, you know, if you're kissed, just... <laughs> No matter how dirty the beard. Just <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, so, I mean, we've mentioned, you've mentioned George Villiers several times, the Duke of Somerset, and that is... No, Buckingham. Duke of Buckingham. Yeah, yeah, Somerset was his rival, that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, has anybody been watching George and Mary or have watched it? Well, that's interesting. Uh, you know about George and Mary, the TV series? Um, it is about George Villiers being pushed in the TV series by his mother, which is, mm, when, mm. I don't know how true that is. Mm. But he kind of worms his way into the court of King James. Um, and, you know, there is, there is always... It's quite interesting, because Philly and I were talking before we started, of I, I find historical dramas irritating <coughs> if they try too hard to say, oh, look, they're just like us. They behave mm. just like us. And behaving in a modern way and seemingly to be set up in a society that feels very contemporary. And I can understand that. I'm always interested in the past in how it's different. But, Ophelia, you, you, you are pro the idea of well, at least the fact that balance. people are I, people. 
I, you know, I have the same problems with saying they're just like us in ways that actually they weren't just like us. Right. That I do have a problem with, but I, I also don't go the other way of saying, oh, I'm only interested in the differences, because to me that's sort of like, you know, if you travel to a foreign country and don't look for any of the commonality between people, people are people, and that is still a fundamental aspect of mm. reading history as well as understanding the cultural differences. You need both, that, that sort of balance, I think. But um, that is obviously not the balance that that program was going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it seems to present King James's court as being openly gay and nobody really commenting on it very much, which well, yeah. is not. <laughs> no. That's, I mean, for a start, you know, the, the concept, there was no real concept of homosexuality, was there? <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> I'm really disappointed that they didn't go for um, the, the intricacies, the really hot story, which is the intricacies of how did you procure the sign manual in the court of James VI <laughs> I? How, you know, how bureaucratically did you make this king work for you and just sexed that up? I think that would have been brilliant. That would have really educated the British public. But I think that, yeah, there, is a, there are so many problems with that portrayal um, of, of James and his court. Um, it's just less less interesting, less dramatically interesting, I think, than things that are closer to what we know was the case. Um, and I mean, with regard to James's sexuality, um, I there are letters um, between James and Buckingham, especially, where there are hints, but they're no more than hints. Did he not? Might have been did he not bit. claim to be his wife? Um, uh, James refers to Buckingham as uh, his wife and child, but then actually there are other men who also refer to Buckingham as their as their son, uh, 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 as his, uh, uh, or themselves as their, as, it's, as, their, uh, as his father. So the language of affection and of intimate friendship should not be immediately, uh, it shouldn't immediately be sort of connected to a modern notion of, a, of sexuality. Mm. Um, because there isn't, there, it, it just isn't there. The, the evidence doesn't, isn't there. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but it does mean that we have to be sensitive. I, I, I looked at some of the reviews of George and Mary on, online. <laughs> I, I've got to tell you this one is fantastic. The king is treated as a highly gullible clown who spent all his days rollicking with rent boys. One wonders how he found time to work on the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody's grasp of history is good. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting that, that nobody here has really watched the series because I was going to ask, you know, as... As two writers who have books on James coming out, when you see, oh, my God, there's a big new TV series about it, do you think, is this a good thing or a bad thing? How does that work? Creates interest. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I would certainly be less sceptical than you that you could have, you know, I think there was enough also gossip of people around the court as well as the letters that there's a, there's a, there's a certain accumulation of circumstantial evidence of things. But in a way, it's less important than mm. the emotional bonds, at least as a biographer, that's how I see things, mm. that the sexuality is sort of actually secondary in importance yeah. to the emotional tie yeah. and um, the strength of that. I think that with Elizabeth and Robert Dudley. Yes. Yeah. We'll mm. never know whether they mm. actually slept together, and they may well not have done, but actually... Mm. Yeah, the bond yeah. is there anyway. And and and, and likewise, that uh, when people say that there is this sexualized or or innuendo laden corruption about the court, they're not necessarily describing something that they know for fact yeah. or that they have seen, but they are engaging in commentary awesome. about other things. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to depict a king as a tyrant. What you do is you depict their uh, their appetites, sexually and otherwise, as somehow disordered in their worldview, and that becomes a, a narrative of corruption. You could do that through religion uh, to say that something is popish, mm -hmm. 
Or you could go down the route of, uh, of uh, a sort of classicising sort of sexual corruption allegation. And the fact, one of the fascinating things about, I don't know if this is the case with Tudor ambassadors, but uh, the French ambassador in the early 1620s, who's um, called Tanagui Leveneur, the Count of Tillières, the French ambassador, um, routinely reports back to uh, uh, Louis XIII in Paris, uh, essentially trotting out this sort of public mm. discourse about yeah. James as if it's fact. Mm. So uh, James has gone off to Royston again with his favourites, like, yeah. like Nero, or he's mm. gone to yeah. Capri to cavort with his little boys. And, it's, and you think, well, why are you saying this? Oh, it's because you're not allowed to go to Royston and Newmarket. Mm -hmm. You're essentially annoyed that the Spanish ambassador is in and yeah. you're not. Mm. Yeah. Um, I wonder, if, if, let's, let's throw it open to the audience now and just make sure we're talking about what you want us to talk about. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? A few, brilliant. Shall we come down to the front here first? That's easy for me. <laughs> Hi, uh, Janet from Hackney History Festival. Um, I understand that the position of ordinary women um, went down massively after William the Conqueror, and I wondered how, how um, the position of ordinary women um, changed across the different um, monarchs. Oh, there's a big question. Um, the position of ordinary women does go up and down across most of history, really. It will depend as well, so sometimes where you are. So there's, there was a, a quite strong argument that for certain kinds of women in urban spaces, particularly London, right at the end of the 15th century, they're in a golden age. Uh, Caroline Barron made this argument in the 1980s, and historians have been kind of batting it back and forth ever since. London's laws are particularly lenient, allowing women to operate by themselves as femme sole rather than under coverture belonging to a husband, which means they can run businesses. And it means they're not responsible if their husband gets into debt or vice versa. So in, in some ways, that's a great time for women. I always find it interesting that there's no real evidence that even once we have queen regnants, mm. the position of ordinary women doesn't really change much. No. Because queen regnant, oh, was well, she special. She's different and she's weird, and we're not quite sure about that anyway. So that's, nobody should aspire to that. You know, that's too, too big. Um, so, yeah, almost the position of ordinary women in some ways goes down across the 16th century, I would say. Um, yeah, under, under James, well, James is, is, is deeply misogynistic in his prejudices, and um, uh, that... Um, and then there is the, the, the witch hunting thing in Scotland, but not so much in England, um, uh, because he is, he is much more sceptical in an English context than he is in a Scottish one. And that, I think, is because he, he's, he's playing to a local audience there uh, to, to some extent. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, if you... Not exactly an ordinary woman, but if you are, um, uh, if you're seeking promotion at James's court, and James hears that you a rumor that you might be under the thumb of your wife, then you may well not get promoted. Um, so, yeah. any more hands up? Um, is it? Oh yeah, do you want to take the one up the back? Then? Thank you. And then. Rebecca, we can come here next. Uh, so I was just wondering, over the time between Tudor and Stuarts and even beyond, how did the court uh, change in its power, its position? Did it decrease or increase under certain monarchs? Yeah, no, I mean, that is an interesting thing. And I, I was going to say earlier, you know, today we talk about, oh, the palace has said this, or the mm -hmm. palace wants to do that. I mean, yeah, how has it evolved? Over I mean, I, I think certainly in the Queen Anne period, you see, obviously... Um, that shift of the court becoming that sort of slightly weird institution that it is today from being a, a true centre of power as a court. Um, and also in terms of the patronage I was talking about, actually patronage moves outside from the court to other more commercial and aristocratic sources. So that loses, in terms of, you know, 
writers and artists and musicians and all that kind of thing. So you have that also being, uh, you know, so there is, there is a, a definite shift um, in terms of its centrality, but it's still, it's, it's still, um, you know, that's not Anne's fault. She's not, she shouldn't be blamed that she did anything to cause that to happen. She was very diligent in her duties and everything, but it was, it was part of the, that evolution of the political institutions. But I don't know if you, do you feel the shift in your periods? Um, I don't, I, I don't think I feel the shift in, in the centrality of, mm. of the court and of, uh, and of, of the councils of the monarch um, in the period that, that, that I study. Um, but one of the interesting um, differences is uh, perhaps that very often it's been thought that, say, under Elizabeth, Elizabeth is, is and her court are much more effective at projecting a certain vision of majesty than, than, uh, than under um, James and, uh, and the early Stuarts. Um, but I think that even that, that's a bit of a mirage because the, the, you have a king, a king of Scots and then of Great Britain who is actually using modern technology of communication to put himself into the hands of a reading public. Yeah. Uh, whereas Eliz what does Elizabeth do? Well, she turns up at you know, maybe every now and again. Right down on Elizabeth. Where, <laughs> I, I just, the, the most overrated okay, okay. Of, of the early modern monarchs. <laughs> Totally useless. Well, it's can I just say on that though, one of the sort of symbolic shifts that I did notice, like, so when Queen Anne first comes to the throne, she goes on this royal progress, which you haven't really talked about, of, of, that was James, for hunting purposes, mm. was very keen on, uh, of going, but she, she does want to bath. Now, she goes to bath partly because her husband's got asthma and she needs to treat him in bath with some waters, and partly because they had snubbed her when she was a princess and out of favour favor with William and Mary. So she's going back to sort of give a snub, you know, fingers up to them. Um, <laughs> And she goes off on this so royal progress, and there are, it's a very weird... So she's trying to be Elizabethan, basically. Right. She's trying to say, I'm very Elizabethan. More and for so, her. Yes. <laughs> and there are, like, 2,000 virgins dressed as Amazons and all that stuff going on in, in Bath, and it's a bit late for, to be yeah. doing mm. things like that. You know what I mean? It's a bit distasteful. And, but the thing that sim symbolises that the court is not quite what it was is on the way back through Wiltshire, they tried to put on these tableaux that are like the Elizabethan masks, but instead of having uh, actors and things, they use real shepherds and real spinners and oh, I keep no. on thinking of these poor Wilshire shepherds who are dragged out to kind of pose <laughs> and do the sort of Elizabethan mask in the oh, countryside. I mean, it, it's really cut price oh, <laughs> progress. James famously yawned at such things. Yeah. Uh, I think he's yeah. yeah I'm much more sympathetic to that. Oh no I think the Tudors were all for it. Mm -hmm. But again that's partly because especially under Henry the Seventh, I mean he's a usurper really so frankly anything that's going to make him look as legitimate as possible, hell yes, please, we like that. Um, and it, I think it's under Henry VII almost that the court really gains in importance. And it's not that it wasn't important before. All monarchs had courts because they all had collections of people around them. But it's under Henry VII that it becomes more fixed in London for a start. Um, but also it's Henry VII who creates the privy chamber, which is this extra layer in the royal apartments. It's an extra layer of privacy. And that means only his mates are allowed in, which immediately makes it the hot place to be. Um, and that really continues under Henry VIII um, and all the way through the Tudors. Elizabeth likes to use her ladies-in-waiting to send out political messages. So if she doesn't want to officially say something, she'll get a lady-in-waiting to drop a line in the ambassador's ear. She does this about marriage a lot because she uses marriage as a bargaining chip um, for way longer than was realistic. Um, but she keeps them hanging on and hanging on, and she uses her ladies to do that. They're, they're like, oh, no, she really likes him, honest. And the ambassador's like, well, if her best mate says so, well, it must be true. We'll stay here then. And then she later on will turn this guy down, and they'll say, but, but she said, she said, well, oh, bad lady in waiting. I will punish her, honest. I mean, it's interesting when you get to the, the modern monarchy, um, and I'm only really going on watching The Crown here. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as we know, is, is completely historically accurate. Um, but there, there does seem to be the sense that the modern monarchs are basically at the mercy of, of the royal court, of the palace. They do what the palace says. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And, you know, if you pull it against that, like Harry and Meghan did, then, you know, you're kind of ostracised. It's very interesting that something that developed to protect mm. the monarchy then becomes something to kind of keep mm. it under control. Gilded cage. Yes. But there's always that theme of like, oh, it's not the monarch, or it's not the royals' fault. It's their yeah. advisors. Yes, no, if only they had better advisors, or you know, a better PR team, or a better communications team, or something. It's just the same as saying they've got the wrong, mm. the, the, yeah. their favourite isn't quite the right yeah. one. Or, you know, a conspiracy of evil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that was yeah. always a thing through the Middle Ages, wasn't it? Yeah. If you wanted to depose a monarch, you wouldn't say, oh, the monarch's been terrible. It's all oh, their advisors have been awful. Yeah. So we've got to get rid of all of them, and we might get rid of the monarch as well. Let's see. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask, you talked about staying under the radar to survive, but with the change of religion at the time, you can't really keep that under the radar. It's quite a public thing, what religion you are. So how did ladies-in-waiting serve both a very Catholic Catherine and a not very Catholic everyone else? So how did they manage that change and to keep power? With difficulty in some cases, um, for women especially, there's this, this, we tend to think that, that families in this period are, are, as you sometimes see them portrayed in dramas, you know, a family sat round a long table in a wood panelled room with a guy at the head of the table like moving family members around like pawns on a chessboard. And when the patriarch says, right, we're going reformist, guys. Um, you expect the whole family to follow them. That's not necessarily what happened. Um, I think most women, if they were very in favour of the new learning and reform and what might later be called Protestant, they tended to keep it slightly under wraps during Henry's reign because you don't want to get in any genuine physical danger. Um, and it's during Edward's reign that they really start to, to pick that up and start patronising really quite radical writers. So there is a degree of staying under the radar. I think in general people were less bothered about what women were doing to be honest. So if a woman is doing something she shouldn't, well it's a husband's job to sort that out. So they're more concerned about what the men are believing or not believing. Um, I think in Henry's reign if you go along with what the monarch says is law this week you're probably cool. You're probably fine. Um, that's the best way to survive. <laughs> Religiously, um, yeah. Under under James, I mean, he he is uh, he's very adept at um, ad he's very adept. Sorry, at, at creating spaces in which people can be somewhat ambiguous about what their <laughs> professional identity is, um, which I think makes him much more interesting mm -hmm. than 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 the whole Elizabethan thing and uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and um, actually to take um, Anna of Denmark, yeah. his consort, where it is still a matter of, of, of historical debate as to what she was in mm. confessional religious terms, but it was mightily useful for James VI as a candidate, as the, 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 the most uh, likely successor to Elizabeth I, um, but not necessarily an undisputed one. It was mightily useful for him to have a consort who could plausibly present themselves to certain audiences, particularly mm. abroad, at certain times as Catholic, mm. um, whereas not in other circumstances. But she had all the different priests and confessors. Like she had, her hawking master was basically a Jesuit confessor, and then she had a... a uh, in disguise, basically, she still had a German Lutheran one, and she had an <laughs> Anglican one, and they are all, you know. And it, when she's dying, it's a real mess because it's like mm. who's going to come in to get her last, mm. to do the last rites and everything, you know? D who did she do? Who saw her and who didn't, and all that kind of thing. And by the time, even in the Queen Anne period, I mean, it's still religion. You know, that is one of the probably the fun, one of the fundamental differences that came between Anne and Sarah was that Anne was a, a deeply pious religious woman and Sarah Churchill was not <laughs> and was very concerned that Anne's love of the church was just code for a whole political agenda that she mm. didn't want to see come in. Uh, we come up to you up there. Um, just do you think there are more um, lovers of the student Sorry, the Stuart and Tudor court who deserve their story being told? Because we got George Villiers about three months ago, but I couldn't watch it. But do you think there are more who do deserve 
a story being told for adaptation? I mean, there, there's hundreds. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, you know, it's what I found doing my podcast series is, you know, I thought, well, I'll just do briefly skip through the life of a monarch and then you think, oh, that bit's interesting, that bit's interesting, oh, that was an interesting person. I mean, I think you, any period in history you could, but yeah, I mean, do you each have a candidate of, if you had world enough and time, you might think, well, I'll write a book about them. <laughs> any of the ladies in waiting? <clears throat> yeah, but the problem is, is the available source material. The reason I wrote a group biography is because usually, for my period, there isn't enough information left to write a really full biography of one individual lady-in-waiting. And if there is, somebody's probably tried it already, you know. Nah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to, but... to do what Ophelia does and write fiction. Yeah, Make it all right. you never know. Find you at the moment. We'll <laughs> but, um, so, uh, Alex, I mean, do you have a, a, a better candidate than George Villiers? Well, I, I suppose it wouldn't be too difficult to find a more likeable <laughs> candidate than George Villiers, um, though, though he, was, he was devastatingly charming. Um, I do think that actually a, a, some sort of adaptation that looked really closely at the relationship between James and Anna of Denmark and Robert Carr... Earl of Somerset. Mm. I think that, that there, um, and the period that that covers with then uh, the, the tragic death of Prince Henry, um, uh, Anna and James's eldest son, um, that's a, that I think would be, would be fascinating. And there is rich source material for that. Um, so an adaptation of the book you've just written. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I, if, I wanted a, if I wanted an adaptation of the book I've just written, then I would have said, oh, we, we need a, we need a dramatisation of the, his first, his first favourite, oh, Esme Stewart, Lennox, yeah. um, uh, Daubeny, yeah. the Duke of Lennox, but, yeah. uh, but there is, there, there, there is a, a, a thesis that's just been completed on him, which I hope does go on to become mm -hmm. a very successful book. And what about you, Ophelia? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the people who interest me that I've thought, oh, I wish I could write books about them, are not, don't tend to be the royals or even the royal lovers. They're the sort of people just, the sort of more ordinary... Um, I mean, Sarah has... Sarah Churchill, for example... I mean, I wrote The Kit Kat Club because I was interested in the people simultaneous... The, the, these sort of men who were in the same time period that I found when I was researching her. But there's also some amazing sort of more ordinary women, going back to your question about ordinary women who were, in, who were journalists and things at the time, who were living quite unconventional lives and really um, writing quite, you know, publishing really quite extraordinary things. Um, and those are the people I'd like to see, you know, things about, not, not just royals. <laughs> No, oh, well, it, it, uh, I think the question was, was yes, it was wider than that. Is uh, is who's who's out there? And I mean, you know, this is the fantastic thing about history. There's always new people to discover and to talk about. Uh, and wish we could talk longer here today, but that is the end of our session. So, will you please give a huge round of applause for Mrs. Alex? <laughs>